would I remind you that please turn off all of your cell phone so that you will not interrupt the session, please. Um, the president of Chiang Mai University, the dean of medical faculty, honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the special seminar by a keynote speaker, uh, Professor Farid Murad, a Nobel laureate in medicine. My name is Dr. Nippon Shatipagon, and I will be your moderator for today's special event. Um, I need to emphasize uh, that it is a fairly special since it is the opportunity uh, to see and to listen uh, to a live presentation by a Nobel laureate. This chance does not come fairly often. So I would like to take this time to thank Chiang Mai University for allowing this to happen. I also would like to thank Bridges, the International Peace Foundation, and the Thai International Airways for their support that helped make today's event possible. At this time, I would like to ask Chiang Mai University President, Dr. Nippon Duanun, to give an opening and welcoming speech. Dr. Nippon. Professor Murad, Mr. Yanis Hikwai, Director of Events Cooperation of International Peace Foundation, Dean of the Faculty of Medicine, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. One of the rare privileges bestowed upon me as President of Chiang Mai University is the opportunity to preside over occasions such as this. Professor Murad, is in, it is indeed an honor for me to welcome you to our university on this most auspicious occasion. Professor Fordit Murat is with us today under the auspices of the Nobel Prize laureates in Health Science Lecture Series, a program which will provide our staff and students with a unique opportunity of coming face to face with some of the world's most distinguished scientists. A once in a lifetime opportunity that I am sure will be a great source of inspiration. I would like to take this opportunity to express our gratitude to the International Peace Foundation without whose support today's lecture would not be possible. Also to thank the Dean and his colleagues at the Faculty of Medicine for the time and energy they have contributed to organizing and hosting this event. Professor Murad, please accept our most sincere thanks and appreciation for honoring our university with your presence. And I trust that the memories you take with you of our university and our city will hasten your return in the not too distant future. Thank you. The International Peace Foundation is an organization that supports today's special event to happen. At this time, I would like to ask the Director of Events Coordinator of the International Peace Foundation, Mr. Janice Hegwine, to introduce us to this organization and its work. Mr. Hegwine. Thank you. I'm going to say a few words on behalf of Uwe Moravetz, Chairman of the International Peace Foundation, who unfortunately cannot be here today, but who expresses his best wishes to all of you. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I have no concept for peace and no solution how to achieve peace, but I know that the first step towards peace is dialogue, and the first step towards dialogue is respect. The International Peace Foundation doesn't take sides, but acts as a mediator by creating an independent platform for dialogue where people meet who normally don't meet, people from all walks of life, people who speak different languages, even if they use the same. 
As politicians speak another language than artists and business and religious people and others and scientists, it is seldom that they speak with each other or even work together. We live in a world where some people pretend to know the answer and solution, how to solve problems, how to achieve peace. Thought the quest for peace lies in the art to pose the right questions. Peace is a process, dialogue is a process. It is nothing which is achieved instantly, it needs time. This is why Bridges is not organized as a single conference and then everything is over again and forgotten, but as a series of events over the period of one year in which 24 Nobel laureates for peace, physics, chemistry, medicine, literature and economics build bridges with Thai leaders in all parts of society and with the general public. After the first 20 events of bridges, which attracted 8,000 participants in November alone, we have been approached, especially by students and young people, who want to actively participate in this dialogue process towards peace, which is not something which can be left to the elite of a few, but which needs the participation of everyone. I thank the Chairman of the Thai Advisory Board for the event series Bridges, His Excellency Anand Panayachun, President Professor Nippon Tuvanon, the Vice President Professor Tanan Anuman Ratchaton, and the Chiang Mai University, and all partners and sponsors for our fruitful cooperation, and especially Professor Farid Murad, who came to Thailand without any honorarium to support the events, and I now look forward to his keynote speech and his important contribution to build bridges. Thank you very much. Before we begin the talk session, I would like to introduce you a bit of the story of Professor Murad. I have to say a bit because his CV is fairly thick and could take hours to mention them all. Professor Murad enrolled in the MD-PhD program at the Western Reserve University School of Medicine in Cleveland, Ohio, the United States, in 1958, and received his MD degrees as well as his PhD in pharmacology at the same university in 1965. Dr. Murad has been on so many academic appointments, such as professor in the Department of Internal Medicine and the director of Clinical Research Center at the University of Virginia School of Medicine, and the professor of medicine at Stanford University. Dr. Murad is currently a professor at the University of Texas Medical School at Houston in Texas. Dr. Murad had and always been very active in basic and clinical research and has published more than 275 scientific papers to date. Professor Forrest Murad received his Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1998 for his discovery concerning nitric oxide as a signaling molecule in the cardiovascular system. Before we hear the story of the great discovery in details from Professor Murad, I would like to take this opportunity to give the audience in this room a brief general background on our keynote speaker's work. Dr. Murad studied how nitroglycerin and reacting vasodilating compounds act and discovered in 1977 that they release nitric oxide which relaxes smooth muscle cells. This discovery is a sensation that the simple common air pollutant, which is formed when nitrogen burns, could exert important functions in the organism. The discovery of nitric oxide as a signaling molecule in the cardiovascular system has a strong impact in medicine. For example, it has been known for over a century that nitroglycerin had benefited effects against angina or chest pain. However, it would take a hundred years until Dr. Murad's discovery that nitroglycerin acts by releasing nitric oxide gas and that in atherosclerosis the endothelium has a reduced capacity to produce nitric oxide. As it was said in the Nobel Prize presentation speech in 1998, your discovery concerning nitric oxide as a signaling molecule in the cardiovascular system has not only explained the working principle of an all-important group of drugs, the nitrovasodilators, it has also opened new avenues for patient treatment and diagnosis of various diseases 
Your discovery has lifted medical research into a new era. Ladies and gentlemen, a Nobel laureate, Professor Farid Murad. Well, thank you for the opportunity to visit your university today and share with you some of our interests and in work with uh, nitric oxide and uh, cyclic guanosine monophosphate, cyclic GMP, uh, and uh, how we began this research, where it has gone in the past 27 years now since our discovery of its first biological effects in smooth muscle. And towards the end of the talk, I will show you how this information can now be applied to the development of a lot of drugs for a number of diseases uh, that are currently in clinical development, and I'm sure more will be coming in the next five or ten year period. I have been uh, interested in how cells communicate with each other uh, ever since I've been uh, an in medical student and a graduate student working in the laboratories of Earl Sutherland and Ted Rawl. I joined their laboratory shortly after they discovered cyclic AMP, which we know is an intracellular messenger, the first one to be discovered uh, in 1957, that mediates the effects of many, many hormones, <clears throat> adrenaline, prostaglandins, antidiuretic hormone, ADH, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of hormones regulate biological functions by making cyclic AMP. For this work, uh, Earl Sutherland received the Nobel Prize in 1971 for discovering the first intracellular second messenger. The concept of cell communication, however, goes back well before that, probably more than 100 years ago. Pavlov uh, was a Russian physician and physiologist working in St. Petersburg, Russia, and had a patient with a gunshot wound to his abdomen. This patient, patient developed a, a fistula from the stomach to the exterior. And when this patient would see food or smell food, his gastric secretions would increase. Well now, as you recall from your psychology classes, this stimulated Pavlov to develop similar experiments in dogs. He operated on dogs and created gastric fistulas to the exterior, and when he would show them food or let them smell food, their gastric secretions increased. But each time he would do this, he would ring a bell. And he conditioned these animals over a period of time such that by ringing a bell, they would increase gastric secretion, as he could measure through this fistula to the exterior, without having to show them food. This was the first demonstration with a scientific experiment showing that the brain talked to the stomach. Cells were communicating with each, with each other. And for that work, Pavlov got the Nobel Prize in 1903. He was the third recipient of the a second recipient of the Nobel Prize in Medicine for understanding gastrointestinal physiology 100 years ago. Today we know that numerous cells in the body talk to each other. <clears throat> it's a very common phenomenon. And it's done in a variety of ways. But the concept is similar as summarized in this first slide. This slide shows you three different populations of cells that will all communicate with each other. Let's 
call this cell, cell one, a neuronal cell, a brain cell. Let's call this cell, cell two, an endothelial cell winding a blood vessel. And let's call this cell, cell three, a smooth muscle cell in the wall of this blood vessel. This cell wants to talk to this cell. And it does it by producing substances. And it'll synthesize these substances <clears throat> as precursors that ultimately get metabolized to active principles and get released into the bloodstream. Earl Sutherland called these molecules that come out of this cell first messengers. We call them today hormones, neurotransmitters, autocoids, paracrine substances, cytokines, growth factors, the list goes on. There are hundreds and hundreds of these molecules that are produced by cells as messengers. They can be simple molecules, amino acids like glutamate and, and others, or they can be complicated peptides, or they can be complicated proteins as with the gonadotropins that regulate the ovary and the testis. The principle is the same. These molecules will traverse the bloodstream to find a target. The target is recognized by the presence of a protein in the membrane <clears throat> that recognizes these molecules, and we call these proteins in the membrane receptors. These receptors will only recognize specific molecules and vice versa. It's like a key in a lock. Only a specific molecule will plug into a specific receptor. And there are classes of receptors for all of these first messengers. Once this interaction takes place in that membrane, the hormone does not have to necessarily enter the cell, but it turns on a biochemical cascade in the cell to result in the accumulation of an intracellular second messenger, the first such intracellular messenger of cyclic AMP. When Sutherland and Rawl were trying to figure out the mechanism of action of adrenaline and glucagon on glycogen metabolism to make glucose in the liver, they discovered an intracellular second messenger, cyclic AMP. Today we know that there are probably 10 or 15 such intracellular second messengers, not only cyclic AMP, but cyclic guanosine monophosphate, cyclic GMP, calcium, nit nitric oxide, diacylglycerol, some peptides, several acosinoids. There aren't many of them. There are many fewer intracellular second messengers than first messengers. What is unique about nitric oxide as an intracellular second messenger is that it's the only one that is not charged at physiologic pH. It's also a free radical, and it's a gas, and it has a high degree of lipid solubility, so it can go in and out of cells quite readily. The other second messengers often stay within the cell because of their charge unless they're transported out by some carrier transport process. Nitric oxide, on the other hand, can go where it wants to go. So once it's made in this target cell, it can produce an effect. But it also can go to an adjacent cell to produce an effect on that cell as well. So it's a unique messenger. It's the only messenger that can function inside of cells and outside of cells. So it's an intracellular messenger, it's an extracellular first messenger, it's an autocoid, it's a paracrine substance, it's a neurotransmitter, it's a hormone. And there are no other molecules that share all those features. Uh, is the projector jammed? It's not advancing. Okay. <coughs> now, nitric oxide is a very old molecule. This planet, we think, is approximately four billion years old, four to five billion years old, and oxygen probably appeared about three and a half, three to three and a half billion years ago. But before there was oxygen on this planet, there was, e there was evidence of life. So before oxygen, 
somehow the organisms deep in the sea, maybe near the fault lines in the magma and that was boiling up with all these chemicals and things coming out of the core of the earth, were influencing these organisms somehow because they were generating molecules that were noxious and toxic. Hydrogen sulfide probably, calcium phosphate, nitric oxide, other things. And somehow these organisms, I believe, adapted to these molecules and began to alter their biochemistry and behavior to use these molecules as messengers. And I think that nitric oxide, perhaps, was one of the first messenger molecules between these organisms as they would phagocytize and eat each other and colonize and become multicellular, et cetera. So it's probably a very primitive molecule that participated in cellular signaling. How to prove that, I can't. It's impossible to go back and reconstruct those kinds of experiments, I think. But it became very popular as a molecule about 50 or 60 years ago because it's the product of the combustion of all of the fossil fuels. Any substance that possesses nitrogen when it's combusted with oxygen will create nitrogen oxides. There are five valence states of nitrogen, so you can have families of nitrogen plus oxygen. The nitrogen monoxide is nitric oxide and it's a free radical because of an unshared electron in its outer shell. Therefore, it's reactive, and it wants to fill that outer shell of electrons with another electron, so it oxidizes other molecules that it collides with. It's very toxic. It's considered a pollutant and a poison. It interacts with the ozone layer in our outer atmosphere, and as it depletes ozone, it removes the filtration that we have for ultraviolet light and permits global warming. So the environmentalists became very concerned about nitrogen oxides and nitric oxide and its family. However, I'm going to tell you that it's also how some important drugs work, nitroglycerin, nitroprusside, and others that we use for angina pectoris for heart disease and maintenance of blood pressure, and I'm also going to tell you that it's a natural substance in the body that permits cellular signaling and the regulation of an awful lot of biology. Some of the effects that it regulates are listed here, but this is an incomplete list. It dilates blood vessels and controls blood flow to tissues and organs and regulates blood pressure. It participates in memory as a neurotransmitter. It's toxic and it'll kill neuronal cells with stroke. If we decrease its production, we minimize the infarct size with stroke. It participates in the regulation of the secretion of various hormones, either in the pituitary or in the beta cells of the, the pancreas with insulin. It is responsible for smooth muscle relaxation and motility in the GI tract. And in situations where it's not working properly, there's reflux of the gastric constants into the esophagus causing esophagitis. It has antibacterial and antiparasitic properties. It inhibits platelet aggregation. It participates in a variety of inflammatory disorders. It participates in penile erection, and we'll say more about that, gene regulation, et cetera. The list goes on and on and on. Rather remarkable. Our first demonstration of a biological effect of nitric oxide, as I will show you shortly, was in 1977. In the past 26 years, there have been more than 50,000, 50,000 publications in the field of nitric oxide research, more than I'm aware of any other area of biology. So it has broad application to lots of possibilities in terms of physiologic and biochemical regulation and potential application to diseases uh, in uh, drug development. The key to nitric oxide biology and metabolism is that while many, many cells make it, you have to be sure that you make just the right amount in the right place at the right time. If you don't make enough, you have disease. If you make too much, you have disease. So this is the key to understand how to manipulate its formation and location and effects on various targets 
one has to understand the detailed biochemistry. And once you understand most of this biochemistry, the possibility of developing drugs becomes rather easy. After the discovery of cyclic AMP, a couple of organic chemists gave inorganic radioactive phosphate, P32, to rats, collected the urine, and isolated and purified the organic phosphates. They found two organic phosphates that predominated, cyclic AMP, and the second was cyclic GMP, a cousin of cyclic AMP that differs a little bit in structure because of the position of the amino and hydroxyl groups on the purine ring. This demonstrated for the first time in the mid-1960s that cyclic GMP was a natural product. It's present in tissues and animals. What does it do? Why is it there? It must be important if it's there, right? So this stimulated laboratories to start looking for the enzymes that made it. <clears throat> They're called guanylyl cyclases. They are very homologous and similar to adenyl cyclases that make cyclic AMP from ATP. But these enzymes, a large family of them, soluble in particulate isoforms, will convert GTP to cyclic GMP and pyrophosphate. Other laboratories found that these cyclic nucleotides, cyclic AMP and cyclic GMP, could be hydrolyzed and inactivated by a family of phosphodiesterases that cleave the phosphodiester bond on the three position of the ribose to make the corresponding five prime nucleotide. Cyclic AMP was converted to five prime AMP, cyclic GMP to five prime GMP. There are nine or 10 of these phosphodiesterases, a large gene family. Why is that important? Some are selective for cyclic AMP, some are selective for cyclic GMP, some are regulated by phosphorylation, some are regulated by calcium or calmodulin. So because of the diversity of this family and their regulation, it permits you to manipulate them selectively with compounds that are inhibitors. Why is that important? Because that's a way to lead to drug development and one of the very popular drugs that we've seen around the world today is Viagra. It turns out that the type 5 phosphodiesterase is found predominantly in blood vessels. The type 5 phosphodiesterase is inhibited by sildenafil, Viagra, and other drugs that are now being approved in Europe and the United States for similar indications. What happens in the blood vessels of the corpus cavernosum of the penis is that there are nerves called nitronergic nerves that release nitric oxide as the neurotransmitter. <clears throat> the nitric oxide increases cyclic GMP synthesis in these blood vessels adjacent to these nerves. The cyclic GMP causes relaxation. The blood vessels fill up with blood and that's the mechanism of erection. So what you do with type 5 phosphodiesterase inhibitors like Viagra is enhance the effects of nitric oxide to uh, permit greater accumulation of cyclic GMP. So it potentiates the effects of nitric oxide. And this corrects, in many patients, erectile dysfunction. Other laboratories went after the target proteins that are regulated by these messengers, <coughs> cyclic AMP or cyclic GMP, and these are protein kinases. There are about 150 different protein kinases. These protein kinases phosphorylate serine or threonine residues of proteins or tyrosine residues. <coughs> some are regulated by cyclic AMP, some by cyclic GMP, some by calcium, some by diacylglycerol. They are regulated by a variety of intracellular second messengers. And when these kinases are activated by these messengers, they catalyze the transfer of the terminal gamma phosphate of ATP to a protein substrate. Many proteins get phosphorylated. When proteins are phosphorylated, their three-dimensional conformational shape changes. So maybe this influences the motility of a cell or an organism or amoebae or something, bacteria, 
or if this protein is an enzyme, when it's phosphorylated, its activity can be increased or it can be decreased. This is the gist of messenger transmission and cell signaling. You have a ligand, a hormone, or an agent that regulates the production of an intracellular messenger, and that intracellular messenger activates a kinase that phosphorylates many proteins that mediate those biological effects. It's that simple. The problem is that you've got hundreds of hormones, you've got numerous enzymes that make these messengers, you've got a lot of fa big family of enzymes that modify and remove those messengers, and you've got 150 different kinases, and you've probably got a million proteins in the cell, some of which get phosphorylated. So to put this whole story together is quite a complicated matrix, but it, it's doable with work. As I was finishing my training to go to the faculty at the University of Virginia, cyclic GMP was coming along. Some of us suspected that it might be a new intracellular second messenger to mediate the effects of hormones and drugs. And I said, let's go after two questions. Let's figure out how hormones that do increase cyclic GMP levels in tissues precisely work. What is the molecular coupling between the hormones binding to its receptor and the regulation of cyclic GMP synthesis? If we understood that molecular pathway, we could hopefully intervene with drugs to potentiate that signaling cascade or to block it and now treat a variety of diseases. If there were a lot of hormones that work through this pathway, maybe we could treat a variety of endocrine diseases patients that had too much of a hormone or too little of a hormone to alter the biological response. The second question was, what does cyclic GMP do? If it's there, it's got to be important, it's got to have a function, but none of us knew what that function was. Well, we, we began our studies by working with the enzyme guanylocyclase. And the very first several experiments were quite a surprise to us. Adenyl cyclase is exclusively in the membrane. It's a transmembrane enzyme that makes cyclic A and P. However, when we made homogenates of tissues to look at guanyl cyclase to make cyclic GMP, we found activity in the high-speed supernatant or cytosolic fraction and activity in the high-speed particulate or organelle or membrane fraction. And the, these activities behave very differently from each other. And I'm not going to go into the detailed kinetic analysis and the cooperativity and all, but they behave differently. We were surprised that there were activities in both compartments and behaving differently. We said, my goodness, there are probably several different enzymes. And isn't that interesting because maybe they're regulated differently than each other by different classes of hormones to make different pools of cyclic GMP in the cell that might have different functions. This story is going to be much more complicated than cyclic AMP and therefore much more interesting. And because of the presence of multiple enzyme forms, a lot more potential for drug development. Well, the problem with interpreting biochemical characterization in crude systems is that there's the potential for artifact. There are enzymes that compete for your substrate, GTP, like nucleotidases and phosphatases. There are enzymes that compete for the product that you're measuring, cyclic GMP, such as phosphodiesterases. To ultimately prove that you have isoforms or multiple enzyme families, you've got to purify them ultimately clone them and express them. That's a long procedure that takes years of work. Ultimately, we did that. But in the early 1970s, we said, let's take a shortcut. Let's introduce compounds that will inhibit the competing enzymes in our incubate, crude incubations, that inhibit nucleotidases and phosphatases and phosphodiesterases. So we created a cocktail of reagents <coughs> pyrophosphate, fluoride, azide, hydroxylamine, sodium nitrite, etc. And quite surprisingly, some of these compounds activated the enzyme. Now that was exciting because 
while hormones, some hormones, acetylcholine, some of the prostaglandins, would increase cyclic GMP levels in intact tissue, they did not work in homogenates. They did not work in cell-free preparations. One of our goals was to understand the sequence, molecular coupling, for their effects of these hormones. And if they didn't work in disrupted cells, we could never answer the question. Because you have to work in an effect in a cell-free system to pull the components apart and reconstitute them to verify that you know what you're doing. Hormones didn't work, so we were stuck. But now we had some small molecules that did activate the enzyme, azide, hydroxylamine, and sodium nitrite. And we said, let's figure out how they're working. Maybe they give us clues as to why hormones are not working in the system that we can come back and add some goodies back to our incubation and get hormones to work. So we were very determined for several years to figure out how they were working. It turned out that the azide effect was tissue specific. It would activate some enzyme preparations and not others. It was oxygen dependent. It was potentiated by reducing agents such as thiols. And it had a time lag before the rate of the reaction became maximal of several minutes. All of this suggested to us that these activators were being converted to something else in our incubation. If they weren't the activators, they were precursors of an activator. We did a very simple experiment. We took a tissue preparation, a liver supernatant, where azide would activate, a heart supernatant, where azide would not, a cerebral cortex supernatant, where azide had no effect, and we mixed them together. If we mixed liver with heart supernatant, the azide effect was blocked. And that's because heart possessed an inhibitor of the azide activation. This inhibitor was heat labile, non-dialyzable, therefore a macromolecule. We purified it, and it turned out to be two proteins, hemoglobin and myoglobin. When we mixed liver with cerebral cortex supernatant, the azide effect was potentiated, it was enhanced, because liver converted azide to the activator, the cerebral cortex could not, but when liver did, the activator would now work on the enzyme from cerebral cortex. The factor in liver that was required for azide activation was also heat labile, non-dialyzable, a macromolecule. We purified it, turned out to be catalase. So we had a family of heme-containing proteins that were influencing the azide activation to account for the apparent tissue specificity. This is going to be important in another slide or two as to why this was such a critical experiment. We took these compounds, and not only would they work in cell-free preparations, homogenates to activate guanylate cyclase, they would also increase cyclic GMP levels in intact tissue, brain slices, liver slices, other tissues that we worked with. So they would work both in intact cells and disrupted cells. One of the tissues that we were working with and here again, serendipity and luck. I mean, the fact that we stumbled into the activation with azide was lucky. Now we stumbled into something else that was interesting. I thought that cyclic GMP might cause contraction of smooth muscle. I had known from my work as a student that cyclic AMP relaxed smooth muscle, airway smooth muscle, GI smooth muscle, vascular smooth muscle. And I thought that cyclic GMP would have the opposite effect. So we developed a preparation of tracheal smooth muscle where we could correlate the biochemistry and enzymology with the mechanical activity, the physiology. When we put azide on these tracheal smooth muscles, the cyclic GMP levels were elevated, as we expected, because it did it in other tissues. The big surprise was the tissue didn't contract, it relaxed. My goodness. It turns out that cyclic GMP relaxed smooth muscle. The time courses, the dose response curves, and everything that we did convinced us that one of its primary functions was the relaxation of smooth muscle. And this was true in the airway smooth muscle, gastrointestinal smooth muscle, and vascular smooth muscle. We said if these smooth muscle relaxants elevate cyclic GMP, what happens with other smooth muscle relaxants? 
we turn to nitroglycerin and nitroprusside. You've heard about nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin was first synthesized in 1847 by Italian chemists. It was first used in clinical medicine in the 1870s for angina pectoris, for chest pain associated with heart attack. Alfred Nobel made his fortune taking nitroglycerin and formulating it so that it was less explosive to make dynamite. That's how he made his millions that he gave to the foundation to curate the prize. He had angina pectoris. He was prescribed nitroglycerin but refused to take it because his factory workers making nitroglycerin and working with it would get vascular headaches from the vasodilatation and he didn't want the headaches. So he never took his nitroglycerin. But after it had been used for 100 years, nobody understood the mechanism of action of nitroglycerin. We knew it was effective, we didn't know why. Nitroprusside came along many years later and turned out to be also useful, but much more useful for patients, the maintenance and regulation of blood pressure in patients with severe malignant hypertension or patients with myocardial infarction to decrease blood pressure and therefore afterload and workload on the left heart. We put these compounds on the tracheal smooth muscle, they relaxed. They were expected to relax smooth muscle. But they also elevated cyclic GMP levels and they also activated guanine cyclase. So the whole story now fell together. We knew exactly what was going on. And it's summarized on this slide. This is a very old slide, but a lot of important information. It turns out that there are a long list of compounds that possess nitrogen and we called these nitrovasodilators. You'll see this term <clears throat> used in a lot of textbooks and papers in Goodman and Gill that we coined back in the uh, late 1970s. Hydroxylamine, azide, sodium nitrite, some of the hydrazines, nitroglycerin, nitroprusside, nitrosiureas such as streptocytosin and nitrosamines, which are carcinogenic. All of these are prodrugs, or precursors to generate nitric oxide in our incubations. <coughs> we knew it was nitric oxide that was the responsible intermediate because hemoglobin and myoglobin that we purified from heart preparations were inhibitors of all of these agents. And we knew that heme compounds were, had a high affinity for nitric oxide from some old data back in the 1940s and 50s and we therefore deduced the nitric oxide had to be the activator of guanine cyclase. That was exciting. When we generated nitric oxide chemically in the laboratory and passed the gas into our incubation, sure enough, it activated the enzyme and it activated all the preparations we tested without tissue specificity. This was exciting because it was the first time that a free radical in a gas could activate an enzyme. It was always thought that free radicals were toxic materials that would destroy genes and RNA and proteins and lipids. But here now we had a free radical that could activate an enzyme. And as we purified the enzyme to homogeneity, the concentration required to activate kept decreasing and decreasing, and it was exquisitely sensitive. Nanomolar concentrations could activate the enzyme. Saturating concentrations would increase the activity 400 fold. So it was very sensitive with a very large effect. Uh, and the first demonstration of a free radical re regulating an enzyme. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. This is what a nitrovasodilator looks like on a muscle preparation. Uh, I told you we started with airway smooth muscle, then went to GI smooth muscle, and then to vascular smooth muscle. The reason we went in that order is that blood vessels are very heterogeneous. Only a small fraction of the tissue is smooth muscle. It's difficult to correlate biochemistry with physiology in a heterogeneous system because you may be making the mediators in another cell population. But once you understand the system and what you're working with, you can now go to more complicated models, and that's why we did that. But, but here's a vascular segment that's been pre-contracted with norepinephrine for five minutes or so. And then we add a nitrovasodilator, in this case nitroprusside, and within 10 seconds, cyclic GMP levels start going up. They peak in about a minute or so, return to basals. This is followed by relaxation of the smooth muscle, and the relaxation persists even though the messenger is back down. Why is that? Well, most second messengers are effervescent. They have a short half-life. 
they peak and disappear rapidly. But because of the biochemical cascade with the activation of downstream kinases and the phosphorylation of proteins that have longer half-lives, the biological effect can persist for some period of time. And that's exactly what happens here. So we recognize that the effects of nitrovasodilators such as nitroglycerin were being converted as prodrugs to nitric oxide to activate guanylate cyclase to make cyclic GMP to cause relaxation. That was the mechanism of action. When you have an exogenous material that produces a biological effect, you should ask yourself, is it mimicking the endogenous pathway? The effects of morphine and heroin and other opiates led to the discovery of the peptide in Keflins. There have been many examples of that in the pharmacological literature over the, over the past. So because these drugs were working through nitric oxide, I said, is it possible that the effects of various hormones to increase cyclic GMP accumulation might be attributable to altered redox in nitric oxide formation from endogenous precursors? We proposed in 1978 that nitric oxide was going to be a normal endogenous substance and a second messenger to mediate the effects of hormones. Well, it was difficult enough for lots of scientists to swallow the fact that a free radical activated an enzyme. They were very skeptical. But now to pro propose that this free radical is a normal substance in the body to mediate hormone effects, Murad, you're nuts. And it took a few years before we really got the attention of a lot of other scientists. But ultimately, we did, and we were right. But it took seven or eight years to really uh, demonstrate it in a variety of other ways with, with other experiments where we could measure the quantities of nitric oxide being generated in a variety of tissues and cell types with improved technology and assays that we had to develop. About this time, Robert Furchgott, a professor and pharmacologist and vascular biologist at the State University of New York in Brooklyn, he in the past had described and characterized receptors on blood vessels and contraction and relaxation, uh, and was quite well known for his work. And it was always a puzzle as to why some hormones fail to cause relaxation of blood vessel strips in the organ bath in the laboratory when they were known to cause dilatation and decreases in blood pressure in intact animals and patients. Acetylcholine, bradykinin, histamine, these substances, while they were hypotensive in vasodilators, did nothing on the vascular segment in the laboratory. Why was that? Well, he found that they required the integrity of the endothelium. And as you made a vascular segment to hang in an organ bath, you often touched the endothelium or rubbed it or crossed a paper towel or whatever, and you destroyed it. If you were careful to maintain the integrity of the endothelium, all of these substances would cause relaxation. So therefore, he defined endothelial-dependent vasodilators. And there's a long list of 10 or 15 materials, bradykinin, histamine, acetylcholine, ionophore, thrombin, ATP, etc. But they only work with endothelium intact. They produced a substance in the endothelium that migrated to the smooth muscle to cause relaxation. He called that substance endothelial-derived relaxant factor, EDRF. It had a very short half-life, it was very labile, it only survived a couple of seconds. And when he presented this work at Virginia before his publication, I was convinced that EDRF had to be a free radical or something similar, it was a very reactive species of some kind, and that it might be activating guanylate cyclase to increase cyclic GMP levels to cause relaxation. I suggested that to him. Uh, I thought we were going to collaborate, we didn't, we just went ahead then and did it ourselves, and we were right. It turns out that this is rat aorta. First got worked with rabbit aorta. We pre-contracted these aortic segments, again with norepinephrine for about five minutes. And then we add a relaxant, acetylcholine. You could do it with histamine, ATP, thrombin, bradykinin, it doesn't matter. 
within 10 or 20 seconds, cyclic GMP starts increasing, peaks in about a minute or so, returns to basal. This is followed by relaxation that persists. But this only occurs if the endothelium is intact. You remove the endothelium, cyclic GMP does not increase, the tissue does not relax, and that's because you're not making EDRF. Furthermore, the basal cyclic GMP levels in the underlying smooth muscle decrease about 50%. So the endothelium is talking to the smooth muscle, and it does it by making this factor EDRF to regulate cyclic GMP production, or it can also regulate through prostacycline, another substance that it makes, cyclic AMP formation to cause relaxation. So by the early 1980s, it was apparent that there were two categories of vasodilators, the nitrovasodilators, which generated NO and activated cyclase, or the endothelium-dependent vasodilators, which generated EDRF, which I left off here, to activate cyclase to make cyclic GMP. We then went on for a couple of years and showed that indeed the cyclic GMP would activate a cyclic G-dependent protein kinase, which would phosphorylate many proteins in the smooth muscle compartment, some of which we could identify after two-dimensional gels and, and proteomics and Western immunoblots and so forth. And this is summarized for you in this, oops, next slide. This cartoon represents a blood vessel with an endothelial lining and an underlying smooth muscle. In red are three categories of vasodilators, all of which work by increasing cyclic GMP accumulation in the smooth muscle. The nitrovasodilators, depending on the structure of the compound, spontaneously generate nitric oxide in the bloodstream based on the pH, oxygen tension, the characteristics of the compound, or they're enzymatically converted to nitric oxide, as with nitroglycerin, you require a heme enzyme to denitrate the nitroglycerin to convert it. The nitric oxide activates the soluble isoform of guanylate cyclase. How does it do that? It turns out that soluble guanylate cyclase is a heterodimer with an alpha beta subunit and on the beta subunit, it histidine 105 is the heme prosthetic group containing ferrous iron. The nitric oxide binds to that iron, changes the liganding of the porphyrin in the heme to the beta subunit, relieving the enzyme of inhibition, resulting in activation. And the alpha subunit is along for the ride, but the two subunits have a shared catalytic domain down at the C-terminal into the protein. The cyclic GMP that is made activates a cyclic GMP-dependent protein kinase, which phosphorylates a variety of proteins in muscle. These proteins regulate the cytosolic calcium concentration in the cell. Calcium is required for the phosphorylation of myosin light chain. With lowered calcium, there's decreased myosin light chain phosphorylation, more of it accumulates as the non-phosphorylated form, which results in relaxation. The mechanism of contraction relaxation, these are actin filaments, these are myosin filaments, they slide in and out of each other, as you recall. When you phosphorylate myosin, these filaments are pulled together, the tissue contract, the muscle contracts. When you dephosphorylate the myosin, they slide apart, you get relaxation. Now, the endothelial-dependent vasodilators will do exactly the same thing, these substances, because their receptors are on the endothelial cell, not the smooth muscle cell. The smooth muscle cell doesn't have receptors for these endothelial-dependent vasodilators. When these hormones bind to their appropriate receptor, they bring in calcium from the outside, elevate calcium. The calcium activates an enzyme called nitric oxide synthase that converts the arginine in our diet to EDRF, endothelial derived relaxant factor, which turns out to be nitric oxide, which works through the same pathway. This is important because there are lots of diseases with endothelial dysfunction, hypertension, diabetes, 
cigarette smoking, atherosclerosis, perhaps obesity. In all of these situations, you don't make enough nitric oxide by the endothelium for one reason or another, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. The substrate may be lacking, there may be an inhibitor of this nitric oxide synthase, the cofactors may be missing, uh, and therefore would, you'd benefit with antioxidant therapy. Uh, but nevertheless, you don't make enough EDRF. How do you bypass that? If you have endothelial dysfunction, you can still get vasodilatation with nitrovasodilators. That's why we use nitroglycerin and nitroprusside in sick people in intensive care units, because they've all got atherosclerosis and coronary disease, and they're not going to respond to endothelial dependent phase dilators, but they will to nitroglycerin and nitroprusside. Okay? A third category are the atrial natriuretic factors or atrial peptins. It turns out that the cardiac atria and other tissues make peptide hormones that cause vasodilatation and also influence the handling of salt and water in the kidney. <coughs> when we heard about this work from DeBold and Phil Needleman and others, we wondered if they too would work through cyclic GMP, and indeed they do. They activate the particulate isoform of guanylate cyclase. In fact, it, the particulate isoform turns out to be one of the atropeptin receptors. This is a transmembrane do a protein with a, a receptor domain on the outside, a catalytic domain on the inside, makes cyclic GMP in the same cascade. Now, there are other ways to relax smooth muscle besides these. You can increase cyclic AMP levels. You can block phosphodiesterases. You can decrease calcium with calcium blockers or calcium antagonists. So there are a variety of ways to start thinking about using drugs in combination to get vasodilatation. But these three categories all work by enhancing cyclic GMP accumulation using one or another guanylate cyclase. The nitric oxide is made by a family of enzymes called nitric oxide synthases, and virtually all tissues and cells in the body have these enzymes, with a few exceptions. The gene, the, the, the enzyme uh, exists as an as a iso uh, isoenzyme family with three different gene products with the genes on three different chromosomes. We call them NOS1, which was initially called neuronal NOS, NOS2 or inducible NOS, NOS3 or endothelial NOS. They are all calcium calmodulin dependent. They have a complicated array of cofactors. The NOS2 normally is not present in tissues. You don't see the transcript or the protein unless there's been an inflammatory event. And why is that? Well, IL-1, interferon gamma, TNF-alpha, all the products that are made by microorganisms and by inflammatory lymphocytes and macrophages enhance the the gene activity to make transcript to make NOS2. So if you see transcript or NOS2, there's been inflammation. So it's become an inflammatory marker of disease, which is interesting. And that's important. We'll come back to that. Um, but NOS1, we, we wanted to change the nomenclature because neuronal NOS was, was not appropriate because this enzyme is located in lots of other tissues besides neurons as is the endothelial enzyme that's located in lots of other cell types. And I think this makes more sense. They're numbered in the chronology in which they were first characterized, purified, and cloned. They all catalyze this reaction. This is arginine. The terminal guanidino nitrogen gets oxidized to a hydroxyarginine, further oxidized to nitric oxide, and the other product is citrulline. The cofactors are NADPH, calcium comodulin, FMN, FAD, tetrahydrobiopterin. The enzymes also have a heme prosthetic group. So it's a complicated enzyme that has a lot of homology with the P450 uh, family of enzymes, by the way. So let me try to pull this together now to show you where we're going to start taking advantage of this for drug development. <clears throat> 
We now know that there are lots of hormones in first messengers that interact with their appropriate receptors on cells to regulate one or more cofactors that are required for this enzyme, nitric oxide synthase, to convert arginine to nitric oxide. Very often, the ligand receptor interaction elevates cytosolic calcium to make available calmodulin. But I think it can also influence tetrahydrobiopterin and these other cofactors. And you can also control the activity by the availability of arginine. It turns out that the body also makes an arginine byproduct that's an inhibitor of this reaction, asymmetric dimethylarginine which is also elevated in patients with diabetes and hypertension of vascular disease. The nitric oxide activates the cyclase to make cyclic GMP to go on and do its thing, to activate a kinase phosphorylate proteins. Now, we can perturb this pathway with analogs of the hormones, inhibitors of the receptor, modifying these cofactors, if we oxidize these cofactors, they're not going to be effective. In fact, the enzyme, instead of making nitric oxide, will begin to make superoxide anion, which is more toxic and a problem. We can scavenge the nitric oxide with compounds. They're drugs in clinical trials. We can potentiate the cyclic GMP accumulation with phosphodiesterase inhibitors, et cetera. There are also nitric oxide synthase inhibitors, a whole family of these that are in clinical trials. Now, it's not that simple. While hormones regulate nitric oxide to activate the cyclase to make cyclic GMP, nitric oxide does other things. It can be oxidized to nitrite and nitrate. It can form complexes with other transition metals, uh, iron centers and in enzymes and inhibit them, such as aconitase to inhibit ATP synthesis. Uh, it likes to interact with heme and iron. It'll do other things. It'll form nitrosation products with thiol groups in peptides and proteins. About a hundred different proteins that will form nitrosothiols. Some of these are involved in apoptosis. Some are transcription factors to regulate genes. This could be another important signaling pathway for nitric oxide besides guanylate cyclase. A very important reaction is the interaction of the nitric oxide free radical with another free radical superoxide anion. Whenever you have infection or inflammation, you induce the production of NOS2 to make a lot of NO. You also, through fatty acid metabolism and other pathways, generate a lot of superoxide anion or reactive oxygen species. These two molecules really love each other and rapidly interact to form peroxynitrite, which is very toxic and more reactive than either of these alone. So I think what happens in inflammatory diseases like atherosclerosis or a variety of other diseases is that you start making more superoxide and it pulls the NO out of the pathway and it doesn't allow it to go over here and make cyclic GMP to vasodilate the blood vessel. That's one of the problems in endothelial dysfunction. You're making a reactive oxygen species, removing the nitric oxide. Why are you making the reactive oxygen, uh, reactive oxygen species? Well, because your cofactors for NOS may be in the oxidized rather than the reduced state. You may be depleting uh, arginine as a substrate. A lot of reasons for that possibility. One of the things that peroxynitrite does <coughs> I mean, it'll form complexes with DNA and RNA and proteins and lipids. It'll nitrate tyrosyl residues in proteins. Whenever you have inflammation, you have evidence of protein nitration. Whether it's Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, myocarditis, colitis, nephritis, arthritis, doesn't matter. You have evidence of protein nitration. Now, could this be a marker of inflammatory disease? Is it a cause and effect relationship? It's too early to know. Many of us have been spending time to identify these nitrated proteins and figure out what they're doing. Some of them turn out to be very interesting signaling molecules, kinases and 
uh, enzymes that are responsible for ketone body metabolism, say in diabetes, et cetera. So there are other opportunities here, I think, for drug development as well. Now let's go to how we can begin to apply this. And as I told you, while there are a number of large multinational pharmaceutical companies pursuing aspects of this with Viagra products like products for competition and other approaches, there are a lot of biotechs as well. Probably about 20 or 25 biotech companies have been created in the past decade working on some aspect of nitric oxide biology for drug development. These are some of the things that nitric oxide does, and it's a, each of these presents an opportunity for drug development. As a neurotransmitter, it may uh, influence uh, treatment of some diseases. Uh, you make too much of it with a stroke, it kills neurons, so you'd want to inhibit NOS1 uh, in a stroke. You don't want to inhibit NOS3 because you'll compromise blood flow, so you need selective NOS inhibitors. It participates in memory, glaucoma, in retinal degeneration in the retina. Uh, nitric oxide participates not only in the production of fluid, but the resorption of fluid. And there's been some animal studies that suggest that NOS inhibitors will lower intraocular pressure with glaucoma. We talked a lot about vasodilation, blood pressure, blood flow as antihypertensives uh, for vasospasm, after angioplasties, et cetera. Uh, pulmonary hypertension, a very interesting application. Premature babies have inadequate lung development. They don't have enough surfactant in their lungs, and their pulmonary vessels are very constricted. They have pulmonary hypertension. Because of the pulmonary hypertension, they shunt blood right to left. They maintain their fetal circulation as they did in utero, shunting blood through the patent ductus arteriosus. They're hypoxic blue babies. If you give them surfactant, oxygen, and low concentrations of nitric oxide in the nasal catheter, you diminish the pulmonary hypertension, they stop shunting, they now oxygenate with a correct perfusion through the lungs uh, and uh, correct their hypoxia. And it's really been a very simple, wonderful thing to add. And you can eliminate the need for extracorporeal membrane oxygenation in premature babies. Now, the same can be done with uh, children with congenital heart defects that are shunning right to left. Uh, you can improve their oxygenation as well and give the surgeon more time to figure out how to analyze the, pa the patient and decide what corrective surgery to do. Um, we talked about penile erection in the mechanism. Uh, nitric oxide plays a role in angiogenesis, the formation of blood vessels, as well as the remodeling of blood vessels with atherogenesis. There's evidence of, of nitrated tyrosine proteins in the plaques of atherogenic uh, blood vessels. I think it will help in wound healing. We're now doing some clinical, some studies in animals that will progress hopefully into clinical studies with topical you know, donors for wound healing studies. Uh, it's involved in all the inflammatory processes, and if one could selectively inhibit NOS2, uh, that might help be another approach to inflammation other than COX inhibitors or cyclooxygenase inhibitors. Uh, it's toxic, it kills tumors, it kills pathogens. You know, how can we begin to think about applying it uh, for cancer, perhaps? That's another possibility. Uh, tissue transplantation. When there is uh, incompatibility with typing or an antigenic response with tissue transplant that turns on the f a release of a lot of cytokines, you make a lot of NOS2, you make a lot of NO, you make peroxynitrite, you get protein nitration. Uh, is that one of the mechanisms to reject that tissue? Don't know. Possibility. Septic shock. <clears throat> when you have a serious infection, as I told you, uh, the endotoxin, the cytokines, make a lot of NO to kill the bugs, but also to markedly to vasodilate the blood vessels and blood pressure drops in the patients are very hypotensive with a mortality rate in the intensive care unit of about 70 percent. If you can inhibit the NOS2 selectively, it could be a way to treat those patients, and there, there are studies ongoing. 
The same is true during renal dialysis. When you shear cells in, in catheters during renal dialysis and release cytokines and other goodies, uh, it causes induction of NOS2, too much NO, blood pressure drops. Uh, and you can perhaps prevent the hypotension uh, or maybe even some of the shearing uh, with nitric oxide uh, in those situations. Platelet aggregation. <clears throat> a cardiovascular surgeon from Germany told me that he was infusing low concentrations of nitric oxide in the heart-lung pump, uh, the bypass machine. It was preserving the platelets that were coming through the bypass, the pump. Uh, instead of getting sheared and aggregated, they were now intact. They were returned to the patient. The, patient had, the patients would have less bleeding into the chest and improved recovery times. So there's a potential application there. Um, there, there are more possibilities. The stem cell application, I think, is very early, but it looks, in my opinion, looks very, very promising. I'm going to stop. I think you've probably saturated, uh, and I'll be happy to answer any questions for you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Murak.